going over this question because I don't think I went over it. I'm not sure, but I'm going to go over it anyways just to make sure that I went over it. So I'm sure. Yeah? Okay. Oop, got an error here. How many people plan on, plan on taking the multiple guess so I know how many? I'm telling you, it's a winner. It's a winner. Are you kidding me? Let me give you an example. Okay. The heart is made out of A, cardboard, B, <laughs> jello, C, muscle, or D, none of the above. Yes. It's that easy. Yes. He's lying. I'm not lying. Do you know why? why? Let me explain to you why. No, watch, watch, watch. Let me explain to you why I'm going to make it ridiculously easy. Because that's what you want. You do. You don't want to work hard and learn this stuff. You don't. Most of you don't. Yeah, so, don't. But for those who do, you take the essay. Rock on. If you don't want to learn it, I don't care. Because guess what? When you get into clinical and you think the heart's made out of cardboard, right? Then you fail. And then people pull up to the drive through and say, yeah, I want fries with that Big Mac. <laughs> But here's the thing, it's the God's honest truth. It is. So pay for it now or pay for it later. It's up to you. Say yeah. Have you talked to people who are in clinical? Have you talked to them? Right. They know the heart's made out of cardboard. Okay, here we go. Ready? Who's ready? There's other people who teach the advanced class who are far better than I am, by the way. They wrote the book. Okay, ready? Okay, watch. The heart is a muscle, right? It's made of muscle. It really is. That, there's answer number one on the multiple guess. It's made of muscle. And because it's living tissue, it has to have oxygenated blood supplying it. Are you with me? What vessels supply oxygenated blood to the myocardium? The coronary arteries. Are you with me? And you have two coronary arteries. And you better write this down, better not pout. The openings to the coronary arteries originate at the base of the aorta. Watch it. Here it comes. They have arrows that are pointing to it. Now they're going to bring it in a little closer, and then you're going to see a transparent left ventricle. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you're looking at right here, this is the aorta, and this thing that looks like a 1950s brassiere is the aortic valve. Are you following me so far? What kind of blood is pumped by the left ventricle? Oxygenated blood, right? So watch. Here's the left ventricle right here. And there's oxygenated blood in it. And when the left ventricle contracts to get that oxygenated blood to the cells of the body, it has to force open the aortic valve. How many people are with me? Where do the openings to the coronary arteries originate? The base of the aorta. So observe. So when the little left ventricle contracts, bam, the leaflets of the aorta open up and oxygenated blood is being sent. O2 rich blood is being sent to the cells of the body. But when the aortic valve opens up, it blocks the openings to the coronary arteries. So is oxygenated blood during ventricular systole, when the left ventricle contracts, is oxygenated blood feeding those coronary arteries in the heart muscle? No. But what are the two things that muscle can do? 
Nice. That sounds like a question too. That's a true or false. So when the left ventricle, when the left ventricle relaxes, watch it's going to relax. Just wait for it. Boom. The backflow pressure of blood in the aorta, that blood will fall back down. It will snap the aortic valve closed and it will open up the coronary arteries and feed blood to the heart muscle. So the heart muscle itself receives its oxygenated blood supply during ventricular diastole, when the heart's relaxed. Are you following me? If you write, the heart muscle receives its blood supply during ventricular diastole, don't expect to get a lot of points. I want that whole thing explained to me. Say yeah. Are you with me? How many people follow that? Now watch. Why is that important that you know that? Why, is it, why do you think that's important that you know that? Why do you think? Why do you think? Yeah, but why else? Why is that important? Because you want to make sure that the heart is receiving the blood flow. That's exactly right. All right? So watch. Watch. Well, if, you're going to have a heart attack. Yeah, and that's bad for you. <laughs> the medical term for heart attack is called a grabber. They grab their chest. That's a grabber. You're having a grabber. I'm coming, Elizabeth. <laughs> Do you guys know where that, that's from? Sanford. Sanford's song. Yup. <laughs> and Grady. Mm -hmm. And Rollo. He was a pimp. I mean, I think he was in real life. He had to be. He looked like a pimp. Did he not? Come on, you remember Rollo. Remember Rollo? You're too young. Here we go. Now watch. Watch. I'm going to explain something to you. Can you look at somebody and say they got cholesterol buildup in their coronary arteries? Cholesterol building up in their coronary Can you look at them and say that? Yeah, you could if they were like, ooh, ooh, right? Yeah, they probably got it. Now watch. If they want to determine if you got significant buildup of cholesterol in your coronary arteries, this is what they do. These little lines represent when the left ventricle contracts. You follow? So if you look at these three lines, th these box, th I box it in. Where is the heart muscle getting blood flow through the coronary arteries? in between. Tell me you got that. So at rest, because your heart rate is low, even though you have cholesterol buildup in your coronary arteries, you can still send enough blood flow to your heart muscle where it doesn't produce any symptoms. Tell me you got that. So if the doctor thinks you got a buildup of cholesterol in your arteries, they give you a stress test. And when they stress the heart, the heart requires more oxygen. And what happens to your heart rate? It goes up. So the amount of time that the coronary artery is being filled with oxygenated blood when your heart rate goes up is reduced. And that's when people will start getting symptoms. Do you see that? Bless you. That's why they do a stress test to determine if they have blockages in their coronary arteries. Is it true that like when you start to build up like that, your arteries are full of blood that starts to cut off the arteries? Yes. Yes. That's called angiogenesis, and it only occurs with ischemia, 
regular exercise will not produce angiogenesis, only ischemia. So people can have blockages in their coronary arteries that are like, it's almost 90% blocked. And because they have these little anastomosis, these little extra arteries that grow off before the blockage, they can live a relatively asymptomatic life. Just so you know, and look, look, you're gonna have to know this stuff anyway, so why not tell you? And you can update your Facebook status because this is not on the quiz. So take your time. All right, wait, watch. Do you guys, uh, you know who Tim Russert is? You don't watch uh, uh, Meet the Press? It's right on after Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I can't believe it. Watch, watch, watch. You're going to learn something. This is a coronary artery. You got me? This is called the left anterior descending coronary artery, better known as the widowmaker. You ever hear the widowmaker? You never heard that term, the widowmaker? Now watch. I know people personally who've had multiple heart attacks, multiple heart attacks, right, where part of their heart muscle is dead. And they're like, I've had 17 heart attacks, and I still don't read the textbook. Right? <laughs> But watch, watch. People can have one heart attack and they will take a six foot dirt nap. What's the difference? What, what do you mean, what part of the heart? Like, well, it's like just coronary arteries. It's that's the heart needs off. It supplies the blood to the heart. What part of the heart? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh uh. Then you only have one artery, the left anterior descending. But you got the left circumflex too. Let's not forget about that. I'm going to explain it to you. You want to know why? Do you want to know why? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, when I was doing my clinic, did I told you I was a PA, studying to be a PA? Did I tell you that? Really? Yeah, I told you that. Remember with the lady in the stirrups? Did I tell you yeah. the story about that? Anyways. I was assisting on an autopsy on an 11-year-old girl. And they, had a, they cut open her chest, and then they cut open her aorta. And she had cholesterol building up on the arch of her aorta. Do you have cholesterol building up on the arch of your aorta? Yes, you do. So the, the beauty of it is, is that it doesn't become symptomatic until decades, in your 40s, 50s, 60s, does it start actually obstructing blood flow? Do you got me? So that's why eating good and reading the textbook reduces your risk for heart disease. So watch. And what causes it is the buildup of bad cholesterol, lousy cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. So over time, over many decades, what happens is this, and watch, hang on. Is over time, you start building up LDL cholesterol slowly over those decades. This is the bad cholesterol. Is fat mushy or solid? Well, just play with a little bit of your fat. How does it feel? It's mushy, right? So the body doesn't like that if it has mushy stuff in a vessel. So what it does is it puts a little protein coat over it, like a little scab over it. Are you following me? And then what happens is that LDL cholesterol continues to accumulate. Are you following this? This is what doesn't, this doesn't kill you. This is what's referred to as a stable atherosclerotic plaque. No biggie. You follow? This is what kills you, is this plaque can rupture. And when it ruptures, that fat will ooze out. Watch, like this, like he's going to sneeze. Uh, 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 and a big fat plaque of booger comes out of there. Are you following me? And watch. Blood that doesn't move 
flows turbulently. And turbulent blood flow inside a vessel clots. It is the clot that kills you. No, that's a, a coronary thrombus. That's what kills you. So now watch, watch. And if it happens in the left anterior descending artery, the left anterior descending artery supplies oxygenated blood to the cells that make up the electrical conduction system of the heart. And instead of having a P, a QRS, and a T, you have ventricular fibrillation. That's what's the cause of sudden cardiac death. It's a rhythmia that kills you. That's why when people go down from a heart attack, at the end of the block there, there's an automatic external defibrillator. So you put it on them, you patch the little button, and they go, Tum! and really what it does is it resets the electrolytes in your heart with the hope that it will start beating normally again. Tell me, oh, you got that. That's quality information right there. So why did, why did the 11 year old girl, how did that much build up? You know. got it too. We all got it. No, no, but she, I think she what was her cause of death? I don't know. I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't cardiovascular. I, I forget what it was. Uh -huh. But even at 11 years old, you are starting to build up cholesterol in your arteries. Oh, I thought you meant that's what killed her. No. Oh, oh okay, geez, no. Dude. <laughs> that was a good story, too, right? I'll have to be much more clear with my stories. Can I show you one more thing? Can I show you one more thing? Inside your blood, inside your blood, you have these little things that under a microscope, they look like platelets, or they look like plates. Watch. Piglet was a little pig. So these platelets are plates, but they're little. So they're platelets. <laughs> so watch. When blood is not flowing in an artery, that blood flow is obstructed, right? Because you got a big, fat, gooey bomb there. Platelets will begin to stick together. And when the platelets begin to stick together, they catch red blood cells. In this case, they're blue. And when you catch those red blood cells, you will start forming a clot. It is the clot that kills you. That's why you watch the commercials. Hi, I'm Joey Bag of Donuts. And I was suffering a myocardial infarct. And when I knew I was suffering that, I went to CVS and got some bare aspirin and took an aspirin. Then I got my fatty acid to the emergency room. Are you following? Because aspirin prevents platelets from sticking together. And if the platelets don't stick together, you can't form a clot. That's why anyone over the age of 50 with the known risk factors for heart disease, they're told to take an aspirin every day. That's rock solid, man. Of course. And let me tell you, aspirin is the miracle drug. And listen up, because this is true. All disease is the result of inflammation. And aspirin, ibuprofen, it prevents inflammation. That's why people with rheumatoid arthritis, their risk of cancer is very, very low, than the, lower than the general population, because they've been on anti-inflammatories all their life. Yeah, I do. I go home and I take a bottle of them. Yeah. All right, for the crowd. How many people got that? So did I answer that question? Yes, did. That I completed the cardiovascular quiz portion. Say yes. Mm -hmm. Guys, did I do it? Mm -hmm. Did I answer all the questions? You got me? Okay.
I did, I put a video about it too. But don't look at that. That'll only give you the answer. How many people got that? Okay, so I completed the cardiovascular portion of this. Say so yeah. We're going and moving on now to the respiratory system. Say yeah. Are you happy about that? Yes. Okay, good. Um, give me like, a, let me do this for uh, like an hour or so, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, what a, a fresh uh, heart and lungs look like. Yeah, are you with me? So I'll actually be able to show you like the, uh, the visceral and parietal pleura of the lung and stuff like that. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. And if you don't want to look at it, then uh, you can just uh, turn away. <laughs> <laughs> can you do what take the plaque out of the corner artery yeah yeah hey can I show you something just uh, just real quick can I um, where is it hang on hang on Hey, uh, do you guys know what an angioplasty is? Do you know what an angioplasty is? Yeah, watch. Back in the old days, say uh, 30, uh, 40 years ago, the only thing they could do for people who had blockages in their coronary arteries was to do a bypass, right? They would bypass the plaque. Um, now what they have is what's called um, a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty or a PTCA. So this is a coronary artery and what they do is they thread the coronary artery. They have a catheter that they thread the coronary artery through and then this is the guide wire. You following? Then what they'll do is they'll thread a catheter over it and that catheter has a balloon. And then what they do is they inflate the balloon and they smash the cholesterol plaque into the artery, opening it up. You follow? Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was anytime you mess with an artery, they're made of muscle. And if you mess with it, it will cause the artery to spasm. So people were dying from heart attacks after getting an angioplasty. So this doctor that I actually worked with, Dr. Doros at St. Luke's, he helped um, invent and perfect the stent. So the stent goes around the balloon. So when you inflate the balloon, it has like a little mesh on it. And when you inflate the balloon, that stent is smashed into the cholesterol buildup. The balloon is deflated and the catheter is removed and then the stent remains in the coronary artery. That prevents the coronary artery from collapsing. So that's a, an angioplasty with a stent. And they almost always stent uh, uh, coronary arteries now because of the risk of that spasming. Is there a reason why, like now that they know about the heart attacks, why they wouldn't do the stent? Because you said sometimes they do the stent. Is there a reason why they wouldn't? Yes. Um, if, uh, the blockage occurs at a bifurcation, you cannot stent that. Okay. So you can, you can angioplasty it, but you can't um, do a stent on that. Are they still at risk of the heart attack? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And these stents, what they do is they're actually coated with an um, anticoagulant so that they don't form clots because things that aren't you that are inside your body, your immune system looks at it and says, that ain't me, and it starts putting scar tissue on it. and blood will start sticking to that scar tissue and form a clot. So there, it actually has some anticoagulant properties. Do you have to take blood thinners with that? Um, yeah, they, but they're usually pretty light. Have you ever heard of a drug called Plavix? Yeah, that's a little higher end than an aspirin, but a lower end than, say, a heparin or a, okay. a, a, a Coumadin. Okay. Yeah. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we go. All right, so we st uh, completed the cardiovascular system. Aren't you excited about that? Okay, now I'd like to point out a couple of things. Here, um, 
in the respiratory system especially, it begins, um, we bring out a lot of star power here, all right? I'd like you to take a look at this um, diagram. This, doesn't this look like Glenn Close? There you have it. Then, further on down the line, we have, uh, where is it? We have Tiger Woods with pneumonia. There it is. We've got Tiger Woods with pneumonia. Then, just real quick, just trying to keep it light here. We're learning something. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Oh, and then, of course, we have, he's um, not really considered an actor per se, but depending on your cup of tea and your sense of humor, we have, of course, where is it? We have Kenny from South Park. That was just special. That looks like Tiger Woods all day, though, huh? All right. Okay, so here we go. We're going to talk about the respiratory system. How many people printed off the respiratory system questions, like I asked? Okay. Hey, um, I like you guys, so I'm going to let you in on the ground floor on something. Now, listen up, because I'm not joking about this. I'm thinking about um, starting to produce and patent AMP juice, right? You guys could actually be like actual people. Like before I started drinking AMP juice, I was getting D's, <laughs> right? Now, when I start, I have a, a bottle of AMP juice 33 minutes before the start of class, we'll make it sound kind of scientific. And now I'm killing it. I'm getting a B minus. We got to make it realistic, right? And then watch, I actually thought about it too. Like the cardiovascular system could be cherry AMP juice. Then for the urinary system, it could be like lemonade. Oh. <laughs> right? You really did think about this. For the digestive system, it could be like root beer. Telling you make a million dollars. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Watch it. There's a question on the respiratory quiz. What are the functions of the respiratory system? Don't look at this. It'll give you the right answer. The functions of the respiratory system are to exchange gases. And that is, of course, carbon dioxide and oxygen. The other thing it does is that it warms, filters, and humidifies the air. There's bad stuff in the air. And then finally, it helps maintain the pH of the blood. People must be allergic to the respiratory system. Now, listen up because this is true. Listen up because this is true. Carbon dioxide is an acid. Are you with me? Carbon dioxide is an acid. So if carbon dioxide builds up in your blood, what's going to happen to your pH? Your pH is going to drop. So anything that affects your ability to get rid of carbon dioxide is going to affect your pH. Say yes. What, what, you're, give me the inquisitive health, head tilt look, like what you're talking about, Willis. No, that's an advanced, okay. right? This is a general, right? I mean, cut it out. The fact that I'm telling you CO2 is an acid, that's as good as it gets. Say, yeah. How many people followed that? Okay. All right. A couple of terms you're going to have to know. Write these down. These sound like good multiple choice questions. What does ventilation mean? Breathing. That's breathing. Letting air in and out. Nice. 
ventilation is um, the movement of air. And just so you know, we don't have air in our blood. People were writing air in their answer. Yeah. Did I just, just completely? Good. Because we don't have air in our blood. Watch. That was a defining moment in your education, yeah, and I define that moment. Movement of air in and out of the respiratory tract. You got me? So watch. When someone is, they're intubated and placed on a machine, that machine is called a, a ventilator. It's not a respirator. It's a ventilator, because all it's doing is moving air in and out of your lungs. That comes now to our definition of respiration. Respiration, by definition, is the physical exchange of gas between of gases. Um, since I wrote air, can I tell you something just real quick? Watch. To kill somebody with an air embolism, you have to pump about 20 cc's of air into their vein to kill them. So if you, I see nurses, right? They got draw the medication and they're, they're trying to get all the air bubbles out, all right? And like that. That ain't going to hurt you. If you didn't prime the tubing, for your IV, that's about two cc's of fluid. And that ain't going to hurt nobody. Your body will absorb that. But if you take a big freaking C, you know, 20 cc syringe and you pump air into it, then the person's going to have problems, just so you know. You got that? So don't freak out when you got an air bubble. Actually, you know what I do when I give somebody an injection? I actually put a little air in it at the end. I'm not even kidding, especially the ones I don't like. So when you put the needle in and you put the medicine in, when you push the air in, that little air bubble uh, makes a seal and prevents the medicine from leaking out of the hole. Look, and I'm teaching you respiratory stuff and how to give medicine. And it all relates because we're talking about air in the blood. And of course, there's a student in this class who will never write that again. Air in the blood. <laughs> well, you better know. Okay, now watch. Respiration, I want this. Respiration is broken up into two parts. The physical exchange of gas. So respiration, you have external respiration. And external respiration occurs at the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary. How thick is a pulmonary capillary? How thick is an alveoli? One cell membrane thick. So the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary. Are you with me? Then you have internal respiration, internal, and that is where you have the gas exchange at the systemic capillary, systemic capillary, systemic capillary, and the cell. So that's how you define internal and external respiration. Say yes. You got me. You're with me, guys? Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to take you on a little journey through some of the anatomical features of the respiratory tract. Say yeah. Okay, I have a question for you. Why do we have two nostrils and not just one big one? But you only have one trachea, so all that air goes into the same... Why do you have, what? Why do you got two eyes?
predator or prey? Predator. We're a predator. Um, is a, um, a little birdie in the snow, is it predator or prey? Right. How do you know? Because you probably stepped on it. <laughs> How you distinguish predator from prey is where their eyes are located. We have two eyes in the front of our head that are separated by a distance. And that allows us binocular vision. That allows us to perceive depth. So watch. I'm a, I'm a lion. So I look at an antelope, and I'm like, hmm, that's 35.2 meters away, and I can run that fast. I can get that antelope, and I'll have supper. Tell me you got that. So that determines whether or not they're going to attack or not. Prey have eyes on their side because bad things can come from all over. So they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you follow that? So do me a favor. Wait till I leave tonight and then try driving home with one eye closed. See how you make that turn. I did that. You do that? Oh, I did. I lost one of my legs at work. I had a how did that work? Yes, and uh, you can't proceed depth, so you try to make a turn, forget about it. The same reason you have two ears and not one big one, like the satellite dish. Watch. If there is a murderer over there, and you're standing like this, and the murderer goes, I'm going to kill you. The sound wave comes into this ear first, resonates through your skull bones, and comes into this ear a split second later. And your brain has the ability to triangulate location. That's the bad guy over there. I'm going to run this way. Say, so, yeah. The problem is when the murderer is directly in front of you or behind you. So if they are, just say, hey, Mr. Murderer, will you take a step to the right or left so I can determine your location? And they'll say, sure. That's why you do. Now, why do we have two nostrils? and not just one big one. Because if you had one big one, you could get your thumb in there, man. <laughs> well, if you had a big one, then only half of it would get plugged up. These are for real questions, and they make perfect sense. Now, watch. Watch. This is an artery. You got me? What's blood mostly made out of? Please get this right. <sighs> Made me happy. So watch. Water in an artery flows on the outside of the vessel. So it slides through that vessel. And the formed elements of the blood, the stuff in the blood, flows in the middle. You got me? So that reduces the resistance to blood flow. It's called laminar blood flow. Say yes. So watch. When air flows, if it flows through a single tube, one big nostril, air, whoops, air will flow in a laminar fashion where you will have the clean air here and all the bad stuff in the middle. Do you want that? No. You want turbulent airflow so that the air gets mixed up. And if you recall from our study of the cell, which I know you're still upset that I didn't have the diagram on there because that could have been a difference maker for a couple of you. We learned about cilia, did we not? Yeah. And cilia is found in the lungs, and it can catch bad stuff and move it. So observe. That's why you got two nostrils, and not just one big one. <laughs> and you have a nasal septum that separates each nostril. So when you breathe air in, when it gets into your nasal cavity, the angle of the air coming in each nostril 
it will cause the air to collide and produce turbulent airflow. That allows the air to be cleaned. Tell me you got that. Just so you know, people who do cocaine, <laughs> cocaine is a stimulant. It mimics epinephrine. What does epinephrine do to blood vessels? It constricts them, right? So when people do cocaine, that cocaine gets on their nasal septum, constricts their blood vessels, and if you do it enough, you cut off blood flow to your septum, and your septum rots. That's why people who are really bad cocaine people, they got to have plastic surgery to get a plastic nasal septum put in their nose. Otherwise, their nose crumbles. Like Tyrone Biggums? You don't know who Tyrone Biggums is? All right. I'm here for the 5 o'clock free crack giveaway. <laughs> mayday, mayday. We got a crackhead lifting up the bus. <laughs> you never saw the Chappelle show? It's the greatest show on TV ever. Yeah, you don't know good stuff. Okay, how many people followed this? You got me? Yep. All right. Here's the other thing. Watch. This is my uncle. I never knew he had false teeth. Look at that. Okay, so watch. When air comes in through the nostrils or the nares, you have, this is the nasal cavity right here. You with me? And you can see that the nasal cavity has like these little ridges. These are called nasal concha. And what they do is these ridges provide extra turbulent airflow. And each nasal concha, you have the superior, middle, and inferior concha. Are you following me? Each one of these has a little hole that drains mucus into the back of your throat. So if you've ever gone on a plane, and when they depressurize the cabin, right, you hear people going, <laughs> that's the goob opening uh, the mucus in the nasal cavity going down to the back of their throat because of the change in pressure. Tell me you got that. If you've ever gone on a flight when you have a sinus infection or ear infection, ooh, ooh, them Duke boys got my money. That's painful. Tell me you followed that. All right, so you better write this down, better not pout. From your nose down to the smallest of airways, excluding the air sacs, the alveoli, you, that entire respiratory lining is ciliated. Got little hairs in there that beat. Are you with me? In addition to that, Watch it. You're looking at the lining, and then you got the little cilia. In about every fifth or sixth cell, there is a specialized cell that's embedded in the ciliated cells. And this cell right here is called a goblet cell. Gobble, gobble. And goblet cells secrete mucus. And the mucus rides on the cilia. So watch. As air goes into your nose and flows turbulently, are you with me? You got bad stuff in the air. So as it's flowing turbulently, the little bad stuff gets caught by the mucus, the boogers, and then the cilia will beat it from the lower airway to the upper airway. So this is how it allows you to clean your lungs. Tell me you got that. You followed that. 
So people who smoke cigarettes, here. When you smoke cigarettes, the tar and nicotine, um, specifically the tar, damages and paralyzes the cilia so they can't move. That's why smokers have that really nasty cough. And have you heard of chronic bronchitis? Yes. Chronic bronchitis is usually the result of prolonged cigarette smoking, and the goblet cells get bigger, and the cilia become paralyzed. So they over-secrete mucus, but the cilia can't move it. So they're hacking up giant lung cookies. Did I ever tell you that story? I, when I was working in Chicago, really hot day, and I'm driving home, and I had a 1988 Dodge Dakota 4x4 pickup. It was so jacked up that I couldn't get in the driver's side door. I had to climb in the passenger side. And in order to go straight, you had to turn the steering wheel like this because the alignment was so messed up. And I only had one windshield wiper, and it was on the passenger side. So when it rained, I had to go like this. So one day I thought, I'll just take that passenger side off and put it on the driver's side. That's why I teach at a technical college. So anyways, I'm driving home one day, and this dude's driving uh, this way, and he hacks a lung cookie out his window right on my windshield. And then I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, no problem. Just hit the wipes and the washer. No washer fluid. So I had googer all over my windshield. <laughs> Say yeah. Was I what? Yeah. Well, what am I going to do? Yeah, well, you, when you get older, as you mature in life, you'll realize that, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that, look, you're, you're going to let stuff like that slide, because what are you going to do, right? You can only control the things you can control. So I got his license plate. Then I went back and I slid, slid his tires. <laughs> Them Duke boys. All right, how many people got that? You followed this, guys? Okay. You better write this down, too. <clears throat> better write this down. The lining of the respiratory tract, because there's a question. Lining of the respiratory tract is ciliated, and you better tell me what cilia do. What do they do? They... Right, they move stuff by beating, and they always beat from the lower airway to the upper airway. And also, the respiratory lining is ciliated, and what, um, what do goblet cells produce? Mucus. mucus. And the mucus catches the bad stuff, and then the cilia move it. Also, right, so goblet cells, better tell me what they do. Did I ever tell you what uh, cystic fibrosis is? Yes. Did I? So you now know that it's not just a respiratory disease, right? Mm -hmm. That any part of your body that secretes mucus is affected by cystic fibrosis. Did you know that? Yeah, you learned something. Okay, and then um, it is also very, very vascular. Lots of blood vessels, very, very vascular. And that's important uh, when we talk about um, respiratory pathology, like asthma, things like that. Say so, yeah. Okay, so let me take you through a little tour of your respiratory tract, shall we? Okay, <clears throat> first of all, what are your tonsils? What's the function of your tonsils? It secretes, no, those are salivary glands. What are, what are your tonsils for? Okay, now I like you. <laughs> watch, watch. Tonsils are part of your immune system. Do you eat bad stuff? Yes, you do. There's bacteria and stuff all over the place. So the tonsils, the tonsils, the laryngeal and 
Lingual tonsils protect your oral airway. So if you get, watch, if you get a strep infection, you get bacteria, streptococcus aureus, your tonsils become inflamed and red. Tell me you got that. Do you breathe in bad stuff? Sure, pull my finger. <laughs> you know, only guys think farting's funny. Did I tell you that I gave my girlfriend a Dutch oven and she threw up in my bed? I swear to you. And she threw up in my bed, and I had one of those Tempur-Pedic mattresses that was like 1500 bucks, and I had no plastic cover on it. Well, that's your own fault. Yeah, that's your fault. Right, that, that's karma. <laughs> See, yeah. Uh, who cares? So watch. Listen up. So is there bad stuff in the um, air that you breathe? So there are additional immune tissue called your adenoids. And your adenoids protect your nasal airway. Tonsils, oral airway, adenoids, nasal airway. So watch, if your, if your adenoids are really big, then what you gotta do is you gotta increase the pressure when you're sleeping so that will cause <laughs> snoring. So one of the things that, especially in a young kid, if you have a kid who snores, you should always take them to an ENT to look at the size of their tonsils and their adenoids. And if they're big, they will uh, have to remove them and the kid will stop snoring. My sister had uh, adenoids like really big and she snored to the point where she'd wake up. She, yes. She woke up like, I want to say four or five times a night. Right. There you go. Yeah. That's called obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. So, sorry, just confirm, your tonsils are for your oral airway, your adenoids are your nasal That's right. Okay. That's yep. Right Tell me um, you got that. All right, so uh, since we're on this, can I just show you something real quick? Watch. When you go to bed at night, right, you say your prayer, God bless Tammy, right? And when you go to sleep, there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system that will cause your muscles to become partially paralyzed. Are you with me? So when you go into REM sleep, the restorative sleep, your muscles are partially paralyzed. That's why when you think a monster is chasing you in your dream, you feel like you're running in jello. That's because there is a disconnect between what your brain is thinking and what your body can actually do. In people who sleepwalk, there's not that disconnect. They act out their dreams because their muscles are not paralyzed. Are you following me? So when you go into re the restorative sleep, right, you're like, and your muscles are paralyzed, your neck muscles become weakened and it shuts off your airway. So what happens is that you're losing oxygen to your brain and that sends a signal to your brain, wake up there Jasper or you're gonna wake up dead. So you wake up, right? And then you go back to sleep and you don't even know that you woke up. So you wake up in the morning and you feel like you went 10 rounds in a heavyweight division. Are you following that? And that is obstructive sleep apnea. And what do people do? They wake up, I'm so tired. I don't even want to read the textbook. That's how tired I am. <laughs> so what do they do around 11 o'clock, right? I'm like, I need a sugar bus. So they start eating sugar. Then around 2 o'clock, they start eating sugar. And they start gaining weight. And it makes the obstructive sleep apnea worse. So you get a sleep study, you get a little CPAP mask, you start feeling better, you wake up, you're not as hungry, you start losing weight. And I'm going to tell you, listen up, because this is true. The two things that kill Americans quicker than anything else is stress and lack of sleep. So I make sure, and these are the rules that I live by, 
to get at least 10 hours of sleep a day, right? <laughs> Never play pool with a guy named after a city. And always read the textbook. Them Duke boys got my money. Tell me you're following this here. You with me? How do we get on that? All right, watch, watch, watch. You have hollow cavities in your skull. Those hollow cavities in your skull are called what? They're called sinuses. Better write this down, better not pout. The sinuses have the same lining as the respiratory tract. So are they ciliated? Do they have goblet cells? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the sinuses also have little holes that allow the mucus to drain into the back of your throat. Those little holes are called ostea. Are you with me? So the purposes of sinuses are basically threefold. Number one, sinuses reduce the weight of the skull. If it wasn't for sinuses, our head would be much heavier. And we'd be doing this. You follow? And then what we'd have to have is we'd have to have like a little chin thing with a wheel on it. And that's how we'd have to walk around. But then you could maybe get some rims on it, right? And then get some lights and some spinners. <laughs> then you can hook up a big, big base, and you can be beaten hard. <laughs> no? What? Nothing. All right. So sinuses reduce the weight of the skull. The other thing that they do is they allow for changes in atmospheric pressure. Watch it. If it weren't for your sinuses, when you went on a plane and the pressure changed, your skull would explode. That would limit frequent flyer miles. <laughs> That's why when you have a sinus infection, <coughs> flying is very painful because it doesn't allow that um, uh, change in atmospheric pressure. Are you with me here? Okay. The other thing that the sinuses do is they allow your voice to resonate, meaning it allows you to, your voice to carry a little more because it resonates through those hollows, so it's like an amphitheater. That's why your voice kind of sounds kind of goofy when you're, you got a, um, there's full of mucus. Mm -hmm. The other thing, now watch. So you should know your sinuses. You have the frontal sinuses, here and here, and then you have the maxillary sinuses. So if a doctor thinks that you have a sinus infection, one of the things that they will do is they'll start poking you. They'll go, does this hurt? Does it, you, you ever have a doctor do that? And just go like this, right in the eye. <laughs> and as that sinus, uh, the lining becomes inflamed and infected, when you hit that, it's going to produce pain. All right, now watch. Where is your tear gland? That's where you produce tears, right? In there. Okay, so watch. What did I tell you the first day? No. Oh, did I? I and me and Timmy know you. Okay, watch, watch. You have a window. If you're going to clean a window, do you start in the lower right-hand corner to clean it? No. So is your tear gland in the lower right-hand corner of your eye? No. Good. If you're going to clean a window, where do you start first? In the where? In the middle. In the middle. You start at the upper part, right? So <laughs> you never clean windows? No, I just I start I just start it's in the middle. <laughs> okay. Well, that's why I 
Good thing you're going to nursing school and not window washing school. You'd have to start all over. So watch. When you cry, right, your lacrimal gland, your tear gland, is actually in the upper, your upper eyelid. So when you go boo-hoo, it will clean your eyes. And you, in the corner of your eye, you got these little drains that drain it into the what's called nasal lacrimal duct and then out your nose. That's why little kids, when they don't get the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip for Christmas, they go, <laughs> So the tears start draining down, the nasal lacrimal duct, and then your nose starts running. Say, yeah. Why does your, like, when you cry, after you're done crying, why does your face get swollen? Your eyelids and your eyes? Um, the, watch, the um, crying, the tears have salt in them, and the osmotic effect of that salt in the tears will draw water towards it. That's why your eyelids get swollen. You got me? Now watch, and I know you've all seen it. The five-year-old with that tympanic membrane booger that's blocking a nostril, and when they talk or breathe, it goes in and out. It is. <laughs> you know, that always bothered me. And here's the other thing that bothered me. I'm coming to work. This has got to be 10 years ago, but it's like it was yesterday. And it is cold out. And I see this dude on Racine Street changing his tire. And the crack of his ass is so far out, it's not even funny. And I'm like, how do you not feel that cold air on your ass? How do you not feel that? Like, I would know if the crack of my ass was hanging out. How do you not know that? How do you not feel that? Some people just don't care, I guess. Like, I'm sure he didn't feel it. He just didn't care. Do you have the plumber butt hanging out? Ah, that's beautiful. Okay, watch. I'm gonna educate you here. Watch it. You're gonna you're gonna impress your friends and neighbors with this little absolutely useless knowledge, but it's kind of fun. True or oh, wait, that's not true or false. Which has more moisture, cold air or warm air? Warm air. That's very good. So watch. When you go out in the cold, uh, see your visual. Uh, <laughs> the cold air is dry, and you have to keep your cornea moist. So the lacrimal gland will begin to produce tears. That's why in the cold, your nose runs. You know, you didn't like that one. No. How much did you pay for this class? That alone was worth the price of tuition. Uh, just so you know, listen up, because this is true. It's not the teacher, it's the student. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Stratton Hayden. <laughs> nine grand a semester? Yeah. Nine grand a semester? Nine grand a semester. Well, well, that's ridiculous. All right. So we covered that, huh? The little eyes, why they're water. Ain't that kind of a little bit interesting? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm very happy about that. All right, here we go. Ready? One the other thing I'd like to point out too. And this is I think this is God's sense of humor. I really believe that, right? A couple of things. Number one, as you get older for men, they lose the hair on their head, but it starts growing on other parts of their body. For example, they start getting gigantically long nose hairs. 
<laughs> Some being so long, you need to braid them. <laughs> and then you start getting hair on your ears. I saved a kid drowning in a river with one of the hairs from my ear. Pulled it out. Here, grab that, buddy. And I saved him. There you have it. Okay, so watch. I want this. Air will enter the nares. It will then enter the nasal cavity. Are you with me? The function of the nasal cavity and the upper airway, upper airway, upper airway, which I'm describing, upper airway. The nasal cavity is part of the upper airway. And the primary function of the upper airway is to warm, filter, and humidify the air. So if you have a upper respiratory infection, you have a sore throat, you have a sinus infection, or you got a runny, cloggy nose. That's the definition of an upper respiratory infection. Say yeah. Are you with me? So when air enters the nasal cavity, it is going to flow turbulently and that allows the air to be filtered. And because it's very vascular, a lot of arteries and arteries carry warm blood. That allows the air to be warm to body temperature. Say yes. And because those mucous membranes are moist, it allows you to humidify the air as well. You're with me. The air then is going to enter the nasal pharynx. That is the nasal cavity part of the throat, the nasal pharynx. Are you following me, guys? Now watch. This guy right here is called the soft palate. This is the hard palate. The hard palate is harder than the soft palate. Are you going to write that down? The soft palate is actually made of cartilage. And now watch. Do you ever want macaroni and cheese in your nasal cavity? Good. You should write that down. So when you're eating food, num, 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 to prevent any food going into the nasal cavity, the soft palate bends down, will move downward, and it will direct that food into the esophagus. What's more important, to breathe or to eat? Breathe. Good, I'm writing that down. That's one of Mazel's hierarchy of needs, too. So if you're eating something and someone says something that's funny, it is more important to breathe than to swallow. So anything that was about to go down your esophagus, now you have to move that uh, uh, soft palate, and it will then go into your nasal cavity. That's why you shoot like coke out of your nose. <laughs> when that's how it works. Tell me you got that. All right. Now watch. When you want to eat food, num, 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 num. You with me? Do you ever want food to go into your lungs? Good. So on your to-do list, read the textbook and don't get food into your lungs. <laughs> and have more than one heartbeat. So when you eat food, num, 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 the soft palate moves down and directs the food towards the esophagus. To a guarantee that food does not enter your trachea, there is a piece of cartilage that will cover the trachea when you swallow. That piece of cartilage is called your epiglottis. So your epiglottis closes over the trachea when you're swallowing to prevent aspiration of food into your lungs. Tell me you got that. I'm going to tell you a true story. And now you will understand when I see accidents or people who are in distress, I pretend like I don't see them. 24 
living down in Dallas. I took this girl out to a restaurant, right? So that was when I'm like, I'm going to save everybody. So there was a lady there, and she was eating dinner, and she was overnourished. And she started choking. So I'm like, I'm going to impress this girl and save this lady's life. So I went over, just like you're supposed to do, and I couldn't get my arms around her waist. <laughs> so what are you taught to do? you're taught to go around their chest. So I'm cranking on this lady and nothing's coming out. And when you can't get air in, you become unconscious. So she's a big lady and she starts going down, right? So she's taking me with her. I bring her to the ground best I could, but she had a pearl necklace on and I must have inadvertently grabbed the necklace because it went flying all over the place. So she's unconscious, so what do I do? Call 911, right? And then you go in, open it up, and then if you can't see anything, you start digging. So I went down there and dig, and I pulled out a piece of steak that was about this long. She starts breathing, right? The ambulance comes, puts her in. And do you know that that lady yelled at me for wrecking her necklace? That's a true story. Who said you don't do, you don't blind finger sweep at a baby? You blind finger sweep at an adult? Who told you that? <laughs> when? That's that's a lie. I taught CPR. I invented CPR okay. eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you really wrecked the story, just so you know. <laughs> My point, I don't know what they do now, but in 1987, right, you were taught to blind finger sweep. Anyways, these people are like, this guy just saved your life. This guy just saved your life. And she's yelling, that was my mother's heirloom, right? And you know what I wanted to do? I still had that piece of steak. I wanted to drive to the hospital and ram it right back in. And I thought, that's why I don't like people. Do you understand? I don't like them. I was leaving, this is like a couple semesters ago, and uh, as I'm leaving, there's uh, these students, and there's a lady who's unconscious in the elevator, and I go, that ain't right, and I left. <laughs> really? Why? Huh? I'm not a nurse, I'm a, I'm a life science instructor. And then they'll come over here like, the, so, so they're bleeding, I go, I'm an ambulance. What do you want from me? Say yeah. Here's the other thing that drives me absolutely insane. Oh, there you go. <laughs> what? I see mothers and fathers feeding their baby, right? And the kid's head is like this. <laughs> right? So I feel like going up to them and saying, hey, why don't you go home? Grab a dot. Diet Mom do lay on your bed, extend your neck, and try to suck that down. See how that works out for you. <laughs> then you wonder why kids develop aspiration pneumonia. Wow. People should, it should be mandatory that you take an IQ test and have an IQ of at least 100 before you have a child. You know what I learned? I learned this a long time ago. As the parents go, so go the children. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got idiots sitting in the classroom, guaranteed you got some idiots at home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I'm, I, I know this, right? 
But then I started being a little more observant of human behavior. I'm not that dumb. I'm not that dumb. Wee! Dumb tooth boys. Okay, so watch. Watch. So what's the function of the epiglottis? It keeps you from aspirating. Right, but how does it do that? It closes over the trachea. It closes over the trachea while you are swallowing. swallowing. Okay, watch. What's the function of the larynx? First of all, what is the larynx? The larynx houses the vocal cords. You got me? Are you with me? Now, on Maury, when they have who's the guy and who's the girl, when they're dressing up, right? You could always look at the Adam's apple and determine that. Because guys tend to have deeper voices, so their Adam's apple is wider. The diameter is wider. That's what produces a deeper voice. But now guys are getting their Adam's apple shaved, so now you really don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're shaving. What do you mean, why? I was explaining muscle contraction in advance. The blue chicken leg and the partially chewed beer nuts. That's actin and myosin. No, no. All it does is it shaves down the, the cartilage. That's all it does. Yeah, yeah. Did I tell you about the guy that's uh, at my company? He works there, and he's like he's like 55 years old, and he wanted to get a sex change, right? He wants to change his gender, right? So here's this look. Watch. When, when people go through something like that, it has to be psychologically torturing these people. Do you follow? Because you know that they're going to be ridiculed. And then you have people who have low IQs who will make fun of these people or just not understand it. Are you following that? But here's the thing, and there's just no getting around it, right? He asked me before he told the people at work, he goes, Tim, can you draw these, these, this lab work? I said, yeah, I can do that. And he goes, you know what it's for, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't say anything. I said, oh, I'm not going to say anything. Who, who, why, who cares, right? Right? Why would I care, right? I'm, God bless you. But here's the thing that I just could not get out of my head. He's never going to make a nice looking woman. He's just <laughs> not. But do you understand, you know what I'm saying? And I just felt bad for the guy because I'm like, all the plastic surgery in the world is not going to make you look like a nice woman. And I just felt bad for the guy. So he had like the nose done, his Adam's apple shaped, and the breast and all that. And I'm like, it ain't happening. You know what I mean? Like, what's his nose, Bruce Jenner? I mean... I mean, it's hideous, I get it, but, I mean, and look, watch. For those of you who have lived life, right, who are at least 30 years old, you know how tough life is, yes? So if you can live your life and you can be happier, I say, God bless you, right? Whatever you want, as long as you ain't hurting nobody, I don't care what you do, right? You don't hurt me, I'll, I'll never bother you ever. Right? God bless. Right? Monkeys, lions, and tigers, and I don't care what you do. Is there a way to change how your voice sounds? Like yeah. Voice? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, what you do is you, you strain your voice. I'm not even kidding. You strain your voice on and the vocal cords, which I'm about to show you in a minute, they will scar. And by scarring the vocal cords, that will give you a, uh, that will change your voice. If you hear people who are smokers, both men and women, yeah, yeah, it's your two boys got my body. Right? Uh, but like, I mean, for like a man transitioning to a woman, how would, how would you do that? Like change your voice to be more feminine? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Are you deaf practice? I I don't know. I don't know a lot about that. Well, so. you know, because Bruce Jenner, he still sounds like a man. Bruce Jenner? Yeah. Or Caitlyn. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Whatever. Yeah, that's a tough one. And I, I would always, you know how I am. I'd always see him and go, hey, dude, how you doing? 
you know, and then he gets it, and I'm like, okay, and his name, his name was uh, Paul, and now it's Nikki, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, look. Again, I don't, I, I don't judge lest I be judged, right? Whatever makes you happy. You ain't hurt nobody, I say God bless, right? You're not reading the textbook, it don't hurt me. I got mine. Do you notice how I always get that little, right? I'm very good at that. I know, thank you. Do you get paid every time you do that? I wish I did. I'd retire now. Right? Okay, watch. Looks like an alien. It this they're saying, read the textbook. Read the textbook. Duke boys, got my money. It's a monster. Watch. This little flap of cartilage right here is your epiglottis. And then, watch. The opening, this right here, the opening is called the glottis. See, you learned something. Why don't you give me half of the tuition that you paid at Brian Stratton where you apparently didn't learn anything. And in, what, six weeks I taught you more than you learned in two years of Brian and Stratton? Right then, Duke boys got my money. Watch. These are the vocal cords. You were probably thinking, oh, they look like strings on a guitar. That's why you can change the pitch and tune it now. So as air passes by the vocal cords, they will vibrate. And how you move your mouth and tongue will determine the words that you form. Now watch. Watch. Let's see if we can make a little this a little better. Now watch. When people get laryngitis, their larynx becomes inflamed and their vocal cords become inflamed. So when the vocal cords become inflamed, they cannot vibrate. And as a result, you lose the ability to produce sound. That's why you lose your voice when you have laryngitis. Say yeah. Yep. What's that? I think it's in smokers. Um, after they smoke for a lot of years, something that they know. Yeah, what will happen is that will actually scar and <laughs> thicken. So these vocal cords, this is type 1 elastic cartilage. And if you smoke, drink and not read the textbook, it was replaced by a thickened form of that cartilage so they can't vibrate as quickly. And if you can't vibrate as quickly, you can't produce high pitched sounds. So their voice becomes very gravelly and deeper. But what I was gonna ask is what's that thing that's put in their throat? That circle thing? Yeah. Oh, they had, those people had their larynx removed. They had laryngeal cancer. So what they do is they have the little vibrator there, and as they move the air by, they can vibrate it and produce sound. Okay. Is that where they have to push on it when they Yes. Um, Here's the other thing. Um, the weirdest thing I ever saw, and I saw it at a uh, court, at the Kenosha court. Never saw it before. Guy had laryngeal cancer, and he was smoking through his stoma. Oh, my oh my God. God. You ever see that? That is. Here's the thing, though, and I gotta tell you, oh. right? I would try to make those like O-rings. He could do it perfectly every time. <laughs> there was a lady when I was like in Calvin Ed, when I was younger, she would smoke and she had a little, and it would come out. So I was like, why are you? Well, at that point, why not? <laughs> so that's true. If they become thicker and your voice gets deeper, how come they couldn't make like shave them? They yes. can't. Oh, they can't. Can. Yeah. Can That's why like, uh, uh, all these rock stars, right, all these music people, because they strain their voice so much, they will actually get nodules on their vocal cords, and those have to re be removed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, their voice is not the same. If you listen to Elton John, Elton John's voice has gotten deeper as he has aged, and many rock stars, their voice gets a little deeper as they age because they strain their vocal cords, and they become thicker. So if... Uh, like uh, Peter Frampton, he's gonna be singing like, yeah, he's really deep, yeah, rock star, right? Or like the Archies, sugar, oh honey, honey. 
Tell me you followed that. So the glottis is the opening. These are, uh, this cartilage here is referred to as the false vocal cords, and this bright cartilage here is referred to as the true vocal cords. Say so yaba. You got that. So watch. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you better, better read the textbook. I'll, yeah, I'll get you. Yeah, they're, uh, they're yelling, right? So to produce louder sounds, you have to open up to get more air out. And if you look here, if you look here, wait, what is she going to yell? I think she's saying, God bless Timmy right there. <laughs> wait, hang on. Okay, it's, this is the trachea. And as you can see, the trachea is made up of C-shaped cartilage rings. So you can actually see the rings of cartilage that make up your trachea. Say so yeah, you got that. All right, um, do me a favor, take a break, and then I'm gonna set up, I'm gonna show you that, that heart and lung stuff um, real quick. You got me? Are we gonna lecture after? What's that? Are we gonna do another um, no, I'm just going to show you that stuff, and then you can uh, you can um, ambulate home. Because I know that you guys aren't uh, on a night before a uh, quiz. You tend not to pay attention. I get it. I get it. No, you save it and exit it. All right. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to edit this.